In Surah Ahqaf, verse 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises Prophet Muhammad to patiently persevere, as did all apostles of inflexible purpose. This timeless guidance echoes through the ages, resonating with us in our modern world, filled with challenges and uncertainties. In today's interconnected world, where social media platforms showcase the highlight reels of everyone's lives, it's easy to fall into the trap of comparison and self-doubt. We scroll th through carefully created feeds, filled with success stories, glamorous lifestyles, and seemingly effortless achievements. But are they really effortless? Why do we can't help but wonder why our journey feels so much harder. But let me remind you, behind every polished post lies a story of struggle, perseverance, and resilience. What you see on social media is just a glimpse of reality. The truth is, success is rarely easy, and achieving our goals and dreams requires dedication, hard work, and unwavering perseverance. Let me share a story about a young boy called Arhan. In a quaint village lived Arhan, a boy who had big dreams of becoming the greatest painter the world had ever known. His passion for art burned brightly in his heart, but his journey was filled with challenges. Despite his family's struggles, Arhan persisted. Every day, after finishing his work, he would spend hours practicing his art, using whatever materials he could find. Arhan's skills began to improve, but he faced constant criticism and discouragement from those around him. Arhan refused to give up and held fast to his dreams. One day, when an esteemed artist visited, Arhan impressed him with his talent. Under the artist's guidance, Arhan flourished, showing that patience and hard work can turn dreams into reality. We must remember that life's greatest achievements are born out of adversity. It's the setbacks, the challenges, and the failures that shape us, strengthen us, and ultimately propel us forward. So when faced with moments of doubt or discouragement, let us not be disheartened by the seemingly perfect lives we see online. Instead, let us draw inspiration from those who have overcome obstacles. We have so many examples and inspirational stories from the lives of our prophets and imams. Some of the examples that exemplify perseverance are Prophet Ibrahim, whose life is a testament to the power of faith, submission, and submission to the divine will. Bibi Hadra, the wife of Prophet Ibrahim, who in the face of adversity, in her journey to the barren lands of Arabia, was left alone. Yet instead of succumbing to despair, Bibi Hadra displayed remarkable perseverance. She trusted in Allah's plan and resolved to make the most of their situation. She trusted in Allah's plan and she, in, in her desperate quest, Bibi Hadra ran between the hills of Safa and Marwa seven times, seeking any sign of sustenance for her son. It was during one such moment that the miracle of Zamzam occurred. Another timeless example, which deeply resonates with believers across generations, is that of Imam Ali. As we reflect on Imam Ali's life, let us not only mourn his struggles, but also heed the lessons of his life. One of his earliest struggles came with his unwavering support for Prophet Muhammad's message. Imam Ali endured threats, insults, and physical attacks, yet he never wavered in his commitment to the teachings of Islam. Throughout his life, Imam Ali faced numerous trials, both on the battlefield and in matters of governance. Despite facing overwhelming odds, he never backed down from his principles or abandoned his duty to protect the Muslim community. Let Imam Ali's journey serve as a constant reminder for us to follow such a path in our daily lives, standing firm in our beliefs, speaking out against injustice, and embodying the values of compassion, tolerance, and righteousness. Because in doing so, we honor his legacy and keep alive the spirit of his noble sacrifice for generations to come. In each of these stories, a common thread emerges. Perseverance in the face of adversity. Their stories remind us that perseverance is not just about enduring difficulties, 
but about embracing them as opportunities for growth and transformation. It's about gathering the courage to keep moving forward, even when the path ahead seems uncertain or difficult. Let us not be discouraged by the illusion of perfection. Instead, let us focus on our own path, staying true to our dreams, for it is through perseverance that we will turn our aspirations into reality and unlock our fullest potentials. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. رحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بارئ الخلائق الأجمعين بائث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى كيام يوم الدين آمين رب العالمين أما بعد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ألا أن الله يحب بغاة العلم صدق النبي وآمنا به زينوا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجا أحبائي كلام continuation of تفسير from the حديث of كتاب or from حديث from كتاب الكافي الشريف and yesterday's مجلس we were able to explore to a very very shallow extent the words of our sixth Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajah where the Imam made very clear for us that ilm or knowledge is a prerequisite to amal salih working in the field of religion, working in the field of khidmah of the deen requires ilm and if a person tries to do khidmah of the religion without ilm then 
he ends up performing he or she ends up performing more fasad they end up causing more fasad than good they end up harming the community and the religion more than they actually benefited the community because anyone who works out of ignorance the first enemy is himself because of the fact that he doesn't have ilm as a support system to help him guide him through the decisions he becomes his own enemy due to arrogance the only other thing that he can do is work on speculation or bad counseling or is hard headed for example on his or her opinion hence we find that one of the fruits of ilm is that it teaches us tawadu the fruits of knowledge the fruits of ilm is that it shows us to be humble in any case if we have established from the hadith that ilm is a prerequisite to amal today we want to come and explore the understanding and the importance of ilm seeking knowledge within the institution of islam and tashayyu in particular and to begin with we have hadith al-sharif which is narrated again our reference is kitab al-kafi and i believe there are apps out there where there are certain volumes of kitab al-kafi that are also translated in english and if you are able to have access to this shabab it's one of the biggest blessings there is nothing like starting the day or ending the day with the words of a masum imam in addition to the ilm the barakah that it brings into our lives hadith al-sharif is narrated if you look at the chain of narrators by way of barakah hasan ibn muhammad who narrates on authority of mu'alla ibn muhammad mu'alla narrates on authority of hasan ibn ali al-washa al-washa narrates on authority of hamad ibn uthman and hamad ibn uthman narrates from imam abi abdullah yesterday we said in the hadith when you come across the title imam abi abdullah it's a reference to imam jafar ibn muhammad as-sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa ajil faraj do the hadith is up on the screen tayyib so aba abdullah as you know is a reference to two imams one of the titles of imam al hussein is aba abdullah however when you come into hadith literature majority of the times if not all of the times majority of the times when you come across the title aba abdullah it's a reference to imam as sadiq alayhi salam it's interesting to note this companion by the name of hamad ibn uthman the one who narrates from imam as sadiq Hamad ibn Uthman in Mu'jam al-Rijal there is an encyclopedia of you can say a brief biography and uh, accreditations of the companions of the imams Mu'jam Rijal al-Hadith which was authored by marhum Ayatullah al-Khuy encyclopedia which is used as one of the texts of reference when it comes to Ilm al-Rijal in his Mu'jam al-Rijal he says Hamad ibn Uthman was somebody that is thiqatun jalilul qadr meaning that Hamad ibn Uthman was a person who had reached the highest level of credibility high status and respect if you notice yesterday we said within the chain of narrators there was one person within the chain of narrators whose name was Bani Fadhal Ibn Fadhal and we talked a little bit about Bani Fadhal who were first Shia and then became Aftahi the father Hassan Al Fadhal was one of the people who has narrated hadith from Hamad bin Uthman which is why even though our bahth is not rijali when we said that Sheikh Murtada Al Ansari rahmatullah alayhi says the hadith of Bani Fadhal are to be accepted and are a hujja upon us it is because they have narrated hadith from people such as Hamad bin Uthman in any case hadith is sharif by Imam As-Sadiq ruhi lahu al-fida he says idha arada Allah bi 'abdin khayran faqahahu fi din when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants khair yani goodness for 
any one of his slaves for a believer what does Allah do he inspires them with fiqh in matters of religion shay'un ajib wa gharib if Allah wants khair for his believers or for his slave he inspires them with fiqh in matters of the religion so the first thing we are able to understand from this hadith ahibai is that not every ni'ma is financial or material in nature there are many blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact some of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are non-financial non-material you take for example health health is one of the biggest ni'mas in fact if a person doesn't have health even the financial benefits that he has he can even the financial status that he has even the amount of wealth that he has he is not able to enjoy it if he doesn't have health this is something i guess maybe a lot of us have seen around us i remember even in the uk at one time it was one of the mu'mineen who's very well to do mashallah very very well to do financially skin imtihan from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't have health he had stomach cancer they had to remove his entire stomach such that his nutrition used to come through drips and i remember once we met with this uh, haji we met with the mu'min and I remember he had tears in his eyes. He said to me, Sheikh, today in my bank account, I've got millions over millions of pounds. I can't eat one chapati today. Health, afia, everybody can come to an agreement that health is one of the biggest ni'mas that we have. Maybe even over finances. In fact, we sacrifice our entire finances such that we are intact in terms of our health so this is an important thing to realize and you know realization like this is important why because it allows you to choose the right goals in life it allows you to prioritize your life well and this is very very important particularly for the youth when it comes to career development when it comes to objectives when it comes to goals what you want to achieve in life where you want to be at the age of 30 40 50 60 these type of goals i'm not saying we should it's bad to have financial goals poverty is not an option i have to work our way throughout to have a comfortable standard of living without doubt however part of our goals need to be non-financial command so you find in this hadith allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says or uh, the imam says that one of the uh, conclusions that we are able to deduce is that not every type of ni'mah is financial. Sometimes it's health, many times it's health, but there is one greater type of ni'mah and this is the ni'mah of knowledge, fiqh. If we understand this, then our next question is what is the meaning of fiqh? What does it mean when Imam al-Sadiq says that if Allah wants to give khair to somebody bless somebody with khair he inspires them with the knowledge of fiqh what is the meaning of the word fiqh for this we must go back to the quran because the hadith of ahlul bayt are a tafsir of the quran and the quran to a great extent is tafsir is through the hadith of ahlul bayt so it's important for us to go back to the quran number one to understand in what context is the word fiqh used inside of the Quran? And from here we are able to understand linguistically what the term fiqh means. So for this, we go to the Quran, Surah to Tawbah, which is actually more accurately known as Surah al Bara'a. This is not our topic for tonight, but it's something to think about. Surah to Tawbah begins without Bismillah. But Tawbah means what forgiveness sahih repentance is the far so when you do tawbah you are invoking the mercy of allah that is rahman and rahim yet isn't it surprising that if the surah is supposed to be called tawbah which means that allah is rahman and rahim it should actually start with bismillah rahman and rahim 
But yet this is the only surah that doesn't start with Bismillah. Is actually the accurate name of this surah is Surah Al-Bara'a. Why it is named Surah Tawbah? Oh, is uh, inshallah next time if we have an opportunity. Ala kulli. Our verse Surah Al-Bara'a or Tawbah verse number 122. I'll begin because it doesn't have a Bismillah so we will follow in line with the surah without a Bismillah. Wa ma kana wa ma kana al-mu'minuna لينفروا كافة فلو لا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقه في الدين ليتفقه في الدين derived from ليتفقه يعني تفقه تفقه يعني فقه to seek فقه وَلِيُنْذِرَ قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ This ayah of the Holy Quran is an interesting ayah. It is known as Ayatul Tabligh. From this ayah of the Holy Quran, we are able to deduce a number of meanings. The first meaning that we are able to deduce from this ayah of the Holy Quran is the fact that it is wajib kifai. Wajib kifai to be involved in tabligh and to guide the community. Number one. Number two, we are able to understand that when it comes to jihad, because this verse was revealed in the context of jihad, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed upon the Holy Prophet, not the entire Makkan or not the entire Madani community has to go for jihad. You cannot have everyone in the community become warriors. Rather, you need some people who will instead of going out into war they are actually going to study the religion they are going to seek fiqh they will study the religion and then when they go back to their communities they will guide them this by the way is a jihad on its own so from this verse we are also able to understand that when it comes to mobilizing the masses for example for jihad there are certain people within the population that may be exempt because of other responsibilities that they have not everybody goes to the front lines from this verse of the holy quran as, a, as well we are able to deduce what is known in usul al-fiqh the principle of hujjiyatul khabar al-wahid meaning those hadith that are not mutawatir that have not reached a level of tawatur are still a hujja upon us when it comes to extracting a hukum shara'i. What we want to do is, if we look at the translation over here, and not all the mu'mineen should go out for war. فَلَوْلَا nafar min kulli firqatin From every tribe, from every community, if there is a small group of people, what do they do? لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Their job is to seek fiqh in matters of the religion. Why? So when they go back, When they go back to their communities, They may guide their communities and inshallah their communities may seek hidayah. Seek warning, guidance, hidayah. So the question over here is what is the meaning of liyatafakkahu? What does the translation say up here? Understanding in religion. Barakallah. The word fiqh in its original sense, linguistic and Quranic sense, means to seek a deeper understanding of your religion. Be it usuluddin or furuuddin. To understand a deeper understanding of your religion. So if you are fasting, why do we fast in Shahru Ramadan? If we are praying, why do we have to pray to Allah five times a day? If why is it that Suratul Hamd has to be a necessary part of the Salat? What is so important about Suratul Hamd? In fact, what are we reciting in Suratul Hamd? Why is it that when we enter into Ruku, we say, Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa Bihamde? But when we enter into Sajda, we say, Subhana Rabbi al A'la wa Bihamde. 
Why is it that we do sajda on a moor, on a torba, and we don't do sajda on a carpet? These things are important because the more we understand this, the deeper understanding we have, the more value we get out of the acts of our worship. This is something very logical. It's very important. The importance over here is that when we seek a deeper understanding of the knowledge, we become people of cognizance. When we seek a deeper understanding of the deen, we become people of cognizance. We are not just like robots who are just fanya in things to fanya. It's just being done, you know, mechanically, ritualistically. La. And the person who is ritualistic in their religion, if they don't have a deeper understanding, even when it comes to Tawheed, Adala, Nabuwa, Imama, Qayyamah, if we don't have a deep understanding and we are not able to convince ourselves on the oneness of Allah or the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the me first moment somebody comes up with a shubha, somebody comes out with a doubt, somebody comes up with an alternate theory, we dunda. Our entire faith system crashes down. And we say, no, no, that makes a lot of sense. Why? Because our grounding was weak to begin with. Like a building whose foundation is weak, the first two paper that comes, building collapses. And therefore, there is a hikmah, a greater understanding in deen. Therefore, ahibai, when you look through the hadith literature, and when you look at the Quran, the term fiqh, has always been used to illustrate a deeper understanding in the deen, regardless of whether it is furuwud deen or usulud deen. It is only years later, over a period of time, and uh, I have not researched this, but from what we are able to understand, it is in the later parts of the ghayba that the word fiqh the meaning of the word fiqh actually got changed to what you and I currently know today. Manake, fiqh is in ahkam, masail, tawziul masail, rules of salat and rules of sawm and zakat and hajj and khums. This tawziul masail which we call the books of fiqh. This is a very restricted meaning. The Quranic and this new meaning was implemented during the later stages of ghaybah. This was not the original meaning of the word fiqh. And this happens a lot inside of language where a word in the beginning may mean something particular but over the passage of time the meaning or the usage of the word changes. So say for example in the 70s, in the 60s if English language if you used just by way of example if you use the word mobile in the 60s and 70s if you said to somebody if the word mobile was used it usually meant a means of transportation where you are able to get from one place to another very easily. I am mobile. I am able to move from here to there easily. Yet if you come now, fast forward 30, 40, 50 years later, generally when you say the word mobile, the first thing that comes to the mind, for example, is a cell phone. Sahih Lola. So the movement and same thing in Arabic language. We have many words where the original meaning was something and over the passage of time, usage changes. So if we understand that the word fiqh is a deeper understanding of the religion, yani ilm, you find that the hadith mentions that when Allah wants khair for his slave, he inspires him with a deeper understanding of knowledge. If we understand this as a conclusion, we come to the next hadith. Hadith is Sharif, which is again in Al Kafi, and in this one I haven't written the chain of narrators. But Hadith is Sharif is narrated by Imam Ja'far al Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the Hadith he narrates from Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, where he says, Talabul ilm faridatun ala kulli muslimin. Allah inna Allah yuhibbu baghat al-ilm Seeking ilm is a faridha upon every Muslim and we have another hadith that says Muslimin wa Muslimah male and female without any segregation any distinction seeking ilm 
is a faridha. Faridha yani wajib. Shufu hadith of Imam Sadiq and Rasulullah ahibai. Seeking ilm is wajib. Just like the way salat is wajib. Like the way sawm in shahru Ramadan is wajib. Like the way hajj is wajib. Imam Sadiq is telling us through the words of Rasulullah that seeking ilm is also wajib. Wajib meaning what? A person who neglects his responsibility of seeking ilm, just like the way a person who neglects his salat. Mushkila. What type of knowledge is wajib? Such that, number one, if we neglect it, Yomul Qiyamah, we're in trouble, we're deserving of Jahannam. But number two, wajib means what? You are accountable. Any shortfall in this, you are responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeking knowledge is just like Salat, in terms of its wujub. Huh? It's not something that is optional. So like the way we don't say namaz is only for a certain age group. I cannot say that seeking ilm is only for a certain age group or that once I come out of madrasa, my ilm should stop. Great error. It's a fundamental error. It's a reason for regression rather than progression of a community. So if we understand seeking ilm is wajib, then our next question is what type of ilm is wajib such that if you neglect, then we are accountable towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nar jahannam wa billah. What type of knowledge? Is it all type of knowledge? I cannot say that this hadith, according to this hadith, seeking secular knowledge is wajib, like physics, maths, chemistry. It is important, as we will see towards the end of the lecture. And there may be a hukum shari involved in it as well. But according to this hadith, you cannot deduce that maths, chemistry and physics is also wajib. Because you can't say that the person who, doesn't, who didn't study physics is going to go to Jahannam. La. There is a certain type of ilm that is wajib. What type of ilm is this? If you come to the commentary of Kitabul Kafi, which is authored by Alama Majlisi, Muhammad Bakr al-Majlisi, Rahmatullah alayhi, in his encyclopedia known as Mir'at al-Ukul. I don't know, 20, 30 volume encyclopedia, which is a tafsir of Kitabul Kafi. Over there, in the sharah, in the commentary of this hadith, he mentions the ilm which is wajib is divided into two types. Ilm which is number one, religious. This is religious knowledge. It is divided into two categories. The first category is furuuddin, and the second category is usuluddin. It is wajib for us to seek knowledge in issues of furuuddin and in issues of usuluddin and then under furuuddin he says there are two types of knowledge that are wajib under furuuddin one is that knowledge where you extract a hukum shara'i halal or haram from the hadith but this is wajib kifai yani to become a mujtahid and he says the second type of ilm under Rasuluddin which is wajib which applies to a majority of us if not all of us is ilm of furuuddin through taklid. Meaning that it is not everybody's responsibility to go back to the hadith and to find out and do istimbat, extract hukum halal haram from the hadith because not all of us have the expertise or have dedicated our lives in seeking the expertise to be able to reach such a status. So what do we do? We follow the opinion of the expert, taklid. And over here it's funny because many times it's unfortunate you have these, you know, new type of Shiaism or, you know, this uh, rebranded, new marketed type of Shiaism, and they come and they really, really attack Alama Majlisi. They say, yeah, he was an Akhbari and he never believed in Taklid. Allahu Akbar. Baba, read his commentary. Inside of his commentary, he's telling you that Furuuddin is divided into two. One through Taklid and one through <laughs> Ijtihad. So if it was Akhbari, why would he be propagating Taklid? 
And so then first of all, even the understanding that the akhbaris are against taklid is a fallacy. But anyway, it's a discussion for another time. So furuwuddin, ilm of furuwuddin is important for us. As a community, understanding halal and haram through the tawdhihul masail is a wajib obligation. We have reached to such a stage where alhamdulillah with the decentralization of knowledge and the very many carriers and means and technology and the internet, the means through which we can seek ilm, there is very little reason, if any reason for us to say that we were ignorant. Knowledge is at our fingertips. Access of knowledge is to our fingertips. And Furuwuddin plays an important part, not only in our ibadat, salat and som and zakat, la la, but even in our ibadat. And it is important that even our shabab, our youth are trained that in your life, in your professional lives, in your academic lives, that you incorporate furuddin into your professions. And otherwise, we fall into massive issues, spiritual issues. In fact, in this day and age, if you are in a profession and you don't know the fiqh of your profession, mushkila kabira, rizq haram ahibai. This is the way in which we are moving. So for example, Today, if I'm a GP, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a GP, if I'm a physician, as a Shia Ithna Ashari physician, you know, today, for example, I don't know how relevant the example would be, but for example, I'm a physician in uh, MP Shah Hospital. And I'm Shia, I'm Shia Ithna Ashari. Patient comes to me, and she is four or five months pregnant. And she says, I want an abortion done. I don't know, is abortion legal in Kenya or no? I'm sure. Is it legal? No. It's not, it's illegal. Okay, so then the MP Shah Hospital doesn't come. But if you are a physician, you know, in the West, they have uh, abortion. Abortion is something that is, uh, that is legal. They say it is the choice of the woman. So leave the MP Shah out of it. But if you are a doctor and you're a physician and the woman comes to you and she's pregnant, and she tells you that I would want an, I want to get an abortion done. Enter as a physician, Shia Ithna Ashari. Does your fiqh allow you to endorse or to stamp on the abortion? So a lot of the physicians and GPs in the West mubtala behind, by, by these issues. You have got a legal obligation. You have got a professional obligation according to the medical field but the reality of the matter is Habibi you have got a religious obligation so enter if you endorse the abortion according to the fiqh the salary that you take is this salary number one halal or haram number two enter are you considered as the qatil the killer of the fetus or no are you sharik in this or no and if it is established that you are a sharik, there is a diya to be paid. Diya, blood money, compensation. This is only in the medical field. Similarly, now, you know, uh, even in our daily lives, massage has become a big thing. Can you go to a masseuse from a, from a different gender, from the opposite gender? Is it halal or haram to be able to go for these type of treatments? Sports injuries, we have a lot of people who are sportsmen within our communities. If you have these sports injuries and your physio and this and that is from a namahram. How do you deal with this? Even when it comes to business, not only within the medical field, not only within the field of sports, even within the field of sports as a professional sportsman, you have an obligation towards your sports club. You're getting paid a very high salary. Your performance is non-negotiable. But can you fast in Shahrul Ramadan? Are you exempted from fasting because of your career? Because of your exams? If we are juhala, if we are jahil and we don't have education and ilm in these regards into fiqh, you end up making wrong decisions that take you further and further away from your deen. 20, 30 years later, you find the person, Aslan has left the religion. But it started from things like these. Same thing when it comes to business. You know, when it comes to business, 
Even within the e-com model, you find within the e-com model, something that works really well is subscri subscription-based purchases. You might have even in business where you have set up subscription-based or supplies to your customers or to your vendors. Within a subscription model, am I allowed to increase the price of my goods without telling the customer? How many times you have subscribed to a certain service where the fee of the service changes from 15 pound for example to 20 pound and nobody informed you after five six months you're looking through your bank account you're like hey i say <laughs> how the price went up nobody told me if i'm owning a business can i raise the price on things like this if i'm holding a rest if i'm running a restaurant and i'm claiming that my meat is halal what is the level of research that is obligatory upon me to ensure that the source from which I'm purchasing my meat or my chicken is halal? Because at the end of the day, I'm providing a service where people are consuming food that is the distinction is halal or haram. I remember in one of the centers once, in one of the communities, one of the mu'mineen, she was not familiar or she was not sure about halal and haram meat. And I remember it was Shahru Ramadan and she brought sambusas, I don't know from which Kanti Ben store. And she brought it for iftar. Ya ilahi. Habibi, she fed the entire community or that lady section over there. Sambusa, meat that was not even halal. Mushkil. Mushkil. The minute haram enters into our stomach, remember this one statement Imam al Hussein said on the day of judgment, on the day of Ashura Afwan. He guided the people and gave them mawa'idha and showed them miracles. Baba, no one, it was as if they were blind. You know what Imam al Hussein said to them? No matter how much guidance I give you, I'm showing you miracles on the day of Ashura. Baba, don't fight against me. He said, you know why you have become so kichwangumu? You know why your hearts are sealed? Lakad muli at butunakum min al haram. Because your stomachs are filled with haram. It closes the eyes of guidance within our heart. And hence, it's also important. Career day, I don't know if we have career day as part of the madrasa curriculum over here or within the school curriculum. Mother, career day is very important. We need to help choose our shabab, select the right type of career. Career where he does not fall into fiqhi ishkal between halal and haram. You go to other places of the world, you see sometimes during the career day, our boys remember in one of the places as one of our shabab, Shia Ithna Ashari, careers day, what do you want to become? I want to become a fashion model. Ajib, where was he monini? And to go on the catwalk and you want to do this model for Kelvin Klein. Allahu Akbar. We have to guide our shabab. We have to guide our youth. The world is great in its opportunities to earn. And believe me, you encompass fiqh and halal and haram. You may go through difficult time in business. You may go through difficult time in your career. But the end result... 100% Mia mil Mia is a payoff. Bila shakin wala raib. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The last thing I will say, even though it's supposed to be Majlisit al Muqtasar, I also know Thursday night you have been sitting in Dua Kumail. If you don't mind, I have one point, maybe three or four minutes, and then Masaib. With your permission, we can complete so the Bahat is complete, inshaAllah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرج. So we have established that the ilm which is wajib is ilm in regards to furu din and usul din, fiqh and even usul din. In addition to this, now comes the topic of secular knowledge, physics, chemistry, medicine. Is this also a type of knowledge that is wajib? According to this hadith, we cannot say it is wajib. It doesn't fall within that category. However, what our ulama have said is that there are certain professions 
that are necessary for the sustenance and the flourishing of a Muslim or a Shia community. In order for a Muslim community or a Shia community, we are Shia, so we'll say Shia. In order for a Shia community to prosper, there are certain professions that are critical to us for our sustenance to exist and number two for us to prosper, develop, yani kuendelea, to move forward. There are certain professions, if it is established that they are critical to these two things, then it becomes wajib kifai. So for example, certain places in the world, you have got a Shia community, but in that particular city, there is no access to halal meat. Then it becomes wajib kifai, or it can be deduced that it becomes wajib kifai on one of the people to learn the rules of dhabiha. So they start a halal butchery. If, for example, within the Shia community, within the Islamic community, there, is, there aren't enough female doctors or there is no female doctors and there is no female physicians in order to protect the dignity and the chastity of the woman and she doesn't have to expose herself to a man, to a namahram, leave aside to somebody who is outside of the religion, then you are able, Maraja have come forward and have able to deduce that it becomes wajib kifai to support our women within the field of medicine such that we have the best of physicians, the best of gynecologists, the best of therapists, whatever the need is, in order for the women to get their treatments and yet not have their integrity or their privacy violated by a na mahram so yes to answer the question there are certain circumstances within a shia environment within an islamic environment where it may be deduced that in order for this community to sustain its faith and sustain its identity and to progress we need certain people within these professions then it becomes by way of wajib not aini wajib kifai to pursue these fields and hence through your profession you are able to provide a service for the shia community sallallahu alaihi muhammad wa ali muhammad laylatul jumu'a thursday night ahibai cannot be complete without the masaib of ali muhammad the from the tragedies of imam al hussein The relationship between Imam Al Hussein and Sayyida Fatima Al Zahra, Allahu Akbar. One of the companions of Imam Al Rida, alayhi salam, he came on the days of Muharram to visit the eighth Imam. And he saw Imam al Rida sitting in his house with his sleeves folded up. His complexion had turned red. Imam al Rida was weeping and crying. So the companion entered inside and he said, Yabna Rasulillah, why is it that I see you in a state of weeping and mourning? May Allah never show you any grief in this dunya. So Imam al Rida stood up and said to him, that these are the days of Muharram when my grandfather was martyred and massacred and butchered on the plains of Karbala. The companion was from the poets of Ali Muhammad. So Imam al Rida said to him, the companion's name was Deabil. So Imam al Rida says to Deabil, why don't you not compose a Marthia? Will you compose a Marthia? And through the Marthia, you can revive the dhikr of my grandfather, Imam al Hussein. The Abir said it will be an honor for me to recite this marthia. Subhanallah, this marthia of the Abir has been recorded from the time of Imam Rida till today it is recited on the members of Ali Muhammad across the Middle East. So the Abir recited, began to recite the marthia. So Imam al Rida 
called for a parda to be put in the middle of the room. He then asked his women to come and sit and participate in the aza of Imam al Hussein. The Abil began reciting the Marthiya until he reached a part where he said, Afatimu lau khiltil Hussein mujaddalan wa wayla wa kad ma'ata'at shawanan bishatil furatiya idhan lalatam tifatimu wajhaha wa indahu وجرت دم على عين بالوجانا دقبيل سيد حد فاطمة حد فاطمة كم تكرب لا حد سيدة فاطمة الزحرة كم تكرب لا and had she seen the mangled body of Abab al-Hussein look at the words that Dibil is using he didn't say the broken body of Imam al-Hussein he said Mujaddala a body that is mangled that means the bones are twisted and twined with each other because of the manner in which the horses trampled on the body of Imam al-Hussein what does Dibil say had Fatima seen the mangled body of Imam al-Hussein what would Fatima do? He said, say the Fatima would begin to beat her face out of grief. And if Fatima was to see the bangled body of Imam al Hussein, her tears would uncontrollably flow down her cheeks. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. اللهم إنا نسألك بحق محمد وعلي وفاطمة والحسن والحسين والأئمة الراشدين من آل طه وياسين اللهم عجل لولينا الفرج. I pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى on a night like this to forgive to hasten the reappearance of Imam Al Hujja. I pray to Allah سبحانه وتعالى on a night like this to forgive us our sins, Ya Allah. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a night like this, Thursday night, marhumin, marhumat, those who have passed away, Ya Allah, you make their gardens, into, you make their graves into a garden from the gardens of Jannah, Ya Allah. Laylatul Jum'ah, there are many, many of our community members who are in need of du'as, who are in need of shafa'a. I believe Laylatul Jum'ah, with the dhikr of the Masaib of Imam al Hussein, du'as are not returned back. If we can take few moments, all of us five times to recite Amma Yujibu, any one of our brothers and sisters who are in need of shafa'a, who are not in the best of health, who are going through any sorts of difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you make it easy for them by the sake of this Laylatul Jum'ah and by the sake of Imam al Hussein, five times Amma Yujibu. A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, Amma Yujibu al Mudtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu su. Amman yujibu al-mudtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-suh Amman yujibu al-mudtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-suh Amman yujibu al-mudtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-suh Amman yujibu al-mudtarra idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-shu Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu, Ya Allahu Ya Allahu, Ya Allah Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima